All right. I believe that's everyone in here, correct? Anyone waiting still? All right. So welcome, everybody. Um, this is the Coal Mine Avenue at Van Gordon Way intersection study. This is a virtual town hall that we're holding um, between myself with Benish and Jefferson County. Uh, so this, I'm John Moskovich. I'm the project manager with Alfred Benish and Company, the consultant that was brought on by Jefferson County. Also with me is Travis Greeman. He's our contract manager. And then we have Christina Lane and Kelly Dunn with the Jefferson County. That will be, those three will be here to help uh, answer some questions after I get done with this presentation. So uh, what we're talking about is uh, Coal Mine Avenue and Van Gordon Way. We are specifically um, just here, if you guys know the area, most of you should, is we're right by Hind Lake Park, right by Pound Powderhorn uh, Elementary and the middle school. We are, we'll be looking at a crosswalk across um, Coal Mine Avenue. So uh, how did we get here? Why are we studying this? Um, this is kind of what our project schedule looks like. Last summer, in the summer of 2021, neighborhood residents informed the county of a high demand crossing location. And since then, this summer in 2022, the county officially identified this as a location that is in need of a pedestrian crossing and selected Alfred Benish and Company to study the location. So in this fall, we began an intersection study and provided the county with some concepts. And we are here today to get feedback from the community. Um, later this year and into 2023, the county will move forward with engineering designs of the preferred alternative and creation of the final construction plans. Next summer in 2023, uh, it's planned that construction will be completed. So we're gonna go, why is this project needed? This is a little technical, but I'm gonna walk everybody through it. Um, as of some uh, accounts that were taken earlier this year, on a weekday, we have around 40, 45 people that are trying to cross the road. And on the weekend, we have around nearly 60 people trying to cross the road. And we're having a peak hour of around 10 to 13 people trying to cross the road. And obviously there is no any kind of marked crossing right now. Um, this whole clip on the left side of your screen is a clip from the CDOT pedestrian crossing uh, installation guide. And basically what you can see here is this yellow highlighted section that I mentioned that I show. And that's our 40 mile per hour speed limit. And what you can see here is at 40, 40 miles per hour, basically any street gets a C, D, or even an F. And what you'll see on the right-hand side is basically what CDOT would recommend uh, be installed, what kind of treatment uh, there should be for a crosswalk. Um, so what those Cs and those Ds and those Fs, uh, what they really say is there should be a crosswalk here. It should have some kind of geometric improvements. It should give uh, motorists a better view of pedestrians to so increase their exposure or increase their visibility, sorry, and put out things such as RFPs and uh, new signs and other things that we can do to increase what, increase the ability for a motorist to see a pedestrian. So when we went through this process, we did a traffic analysis of the intersection to kind of determine what we can do to it to make it to enhance it for pedestrians. Um, everything that we looked at, um, we we determined that there would be an acceptable level of service or also known as delay per vehicle um, per the uh, county standards. So one of the first things we looked at was the westbound left traffic. And what we saw here was a really high volume of U-turns, especially during the uh, pick up and drop up drop off times for the elementary school and the middle school up to the east. And what that represents is that we should really keep this left turn lane here just because there's so many vehicles. There's up to 100 vehicles an hour that actually take this U-turn at those times. 
And another thing with that is that we determined it's probably not a safe location to actually put a crosswalk on this leg, just because if you're having school let out, children crossing the street, high volume of people trying to take U-turns, it could just become a bit of a disaster. Um, so then we started looking at the other side of the road. Um, and on this side, it's we deemed it a little safer for a pedestrian crossing. And at the same time, we determined that left turn traffic has just enough volume to keep a left turn lane here. We don't want to have any kind of backup into the through lanes. We don't want to be slowing anybody down for no reason, causing any kind of um, rear end collisions. Just so keeping that left lane was important. The next thing we looked at was these they're known as auxiliary lanes on the outside. Those are your acceleration and deceleration lanes. And when we looked at them, these three that are highlighted, we determined did not actually affect traffic operations of the intersection. So we allowed ourselves to remove these to help pedestrians, to help minimize the amount of distance that pedestrians will have to cross the roadway. And just so everyone knows, the deceleration lane eastbound um, did actually affect traffic, so we didn't want to look at it, removing that one. So we look at uh, an alternatives, and the county asked us to look at what would happen if we do nothing, what will happen if we have a couple alternatives. So the first one here, we have a rendering of what the street looks like um, as is. So you'll see here, there's no improvements to the intersection. There's no traffic impacts. There's no area for pedestrians to stop in the middle of the road. And there's no marked or signed pedestrian crossing. This is exactly what it's like now. Um, you can see there's a heavy, you got to cross seven lanes if you want to go across this roadway. It's obviously not the safest to be a pedestrian here. So we gave the first alternative that we came up with for the county. Uh, is known as a rectangular rapid flashing beacon, beacon um, RRFB for short. So in these renderings, you can see kind of what it would look like. Um, we would be installing a new pedestrian refuge island. Um, the existing refuge, the existing median would be expanded to meet ADA standards for a refuge island. There would obviously be a, cross, a marked crosswalk, and then there'd be yield lines and advance warning signs. Um, the left, the eastbound left turn lane would become an offset turn lane. As you can see, there's the triangular shape going around the island. And this just helps give us another spot to get pedestrians out of the traffic. Um, and the county and Jefferson County also only asks that we cross two lanes at a time when we're not at any kind of full stop situation, when we just have um, a warning sign like a rectangular flashing beacon. They only want to cross two lanes at a time. Um, in this scenario, the westbound acceleration lane would be removed and a bump out would be installed to re help reduce the crossing distance. And then because of the shift of traffic um, with that new pedestrian island, the, we would have to remove the eastbound acceleration and deceleration lanes just so that traffic hat is in the right Geometric, geometric uh, route. Um, the westbound deceleration lane pavements would actually remain beyond to the east or to the west of that bump out, and we would use this as an RTD, RTD bus pullout so that the buses don't impact traffic nearly as much. And we're just saving money by keeping that pavement as is. So you may be asking what exactly is a rectangular rapid flashing beacon? Um, we have an example here. Um, this is just south of coal mine, close to a lot of you guys in Littleton at Chatfield Avenue, just south of Ken Carl. Um, this is just an example of what one would look like. Uh, this treatment for crosswalks makes the crosswalk itself and pedestrians more visible to drivers. Um, studies out there have found that 98% of vehicles actually do yield to these signs, and um, this treatment reduces crashes, pedestrian-related crashes by nearly 47%. Um, these have been found to be most effective at 40 miles per hour or less. And again, as I just mentioned, Jefferson County does recommend 
it does require that these crosswalks are only installed to cross two lanes at a time. So we obviously need to shorten the distance with seven lanes currently on coal mine. And to the right here, we got a little mock-up of what an RFB would actually look like. Um, you see the pedestrian sign at the top, um, the two yellow lights that would blink back and forth in the middle, with a sign below that showing where pedestrians would be crossing. Um, to use it, you, a pedestrian would walk up to it and press the little pedestrian button there on the bottom. Um, this would activate the beacon. And at that time, pedestrians would go as soon as the traffic is clear and vehicular traffic would yield to pedestrians at the yield line that's installed in front of it. Um, the next one that we have uh, as an alternative that we came up with is a high intensity activated crosswalk. This is also known as a hawk. Um, this is a much more, um, this is a much larger installation. Uh, it includes overhead signals. You'll have those big mast arms, just like you do at a um, standard uh, intersection. Uh, we'd have a marked crosswalk uh, stop sign in front of those, in front of that crosswalk and advanced warning signs. Uh, there would be no new or expanded pedestrian refuge islands because this treatment does stop all traffic. Um, the westbound acceleration lane, again, would be removed and the bump out installed again to reduce the crossing distance. So the less amount of time we have to impact traffic here is better. And then the eastbound or deceleration lane would also be removed to help with that as well. Uh, again, the westbound deceleration lane pavement remains for the RTD bus pullout. Again, we're just not gonna take away more pavement than there already is, and it'll be useful to keep the bus from impacting traffic through this area. So again, we'll go into what a high intensity activated crosswalk is. Uh, there's an example nearby. There's not a lot of these in Colorado, um, but in Centennial on Holly Street, just north of Arapaho Road, you'll find these signals, these triangular shaped uh, or layout for lights. And what these do is they warn in the control traffic to assist pedestrians crossing. So we're not just yield, making traffic yield. This will fully stop traffic, just like a standard signal would at an intersection. We find in studies that 92% of vehicles comply with the stopping. And this also reduces 55% of pedestrian relation, related crashes. Um, this is treatment is recommended for crossing three or more lanes. So that's in a situation where we have seven, we're obviously gonna try to bring it down, but this is better for crossing more lanes. Um, CDOT generally recommends that these be installed if it's 40 miles per hour or greater. Coal mine is 40 miles per hour, so we're right on the edge there. And one of the things, like I said, this is not a common treatment. I actually only know three other ones in Colorado, so it's not common. Um, so education is important here, and we recommend that if this were installed, that the county would increase uh, the education on these signals. So on the right hand side is a little um, view of what people would see and how you'd use this is pedestrians would walk up just like a normal intersection signal and press a push button. These beacons would begin to flash um, and then vehicles would come to a full stop, the stop bar. And at that time, uh, pedestrian signal head would give you a walk signal and you would cross and then the lights would go off um, after set time. So to give everybody an idea, and hopefully this works, is a little video here of how to use a pedestrian When motorists crossing. approach a dark Hawk beacon, crossings. they may continue through the crosswalk without slowing down or stopping. A flashing yellow light means that a pedestrian is waiting to cross and motorists should proceed with caution. The flashing yellow lights will be followed by solid yellow lights, which indicate that motorists should stop if safe to do so. The solid yellow light will be followed by solid red lights. As usual, when seeing a red light, motorists need to stop. The solid red light will be followed by alternating flashing red lights, which indicates that after first stopping, motorists can proceed with caution through the intersection 
as long as there are no pedestrians in the crosswalk. So that gives you an idea of what a hawk would look like and how it would how it would be used. But again, now we have 20 people that know how to use it. This is definitely something that many more people when this road uses 8,000 people a day need to know. So we would need to do some kind of education to help push how these work and so everybody understands. All right, and here we have a comparison real quick of these three alternatives. Um, obviously, we'll look at cost first. Uh, no build, I was doing nothing to the intersection. is obviously gonna cost the county nothing. Um, our RFBs are a decent price, but they're not extremely expensive. These are mostly just signs with some electronics in them with a uh, painted crosswalk and then obviously you'd be installing an island so there is like some concrete work there will be some impacts to traffic at that time um, but then you also have a hawk hawks are pretty extensive um, just like i said they are very similar to traffic signals you've got big steel arms going over the roadway there's more electronics involved it's obviously going to be a costlier installation on the pedestrian safety side uh, our no build alternative and why the reason we're having this is it's not that safe of a crossing it's going to be the least safe of these three and an rfb um, is going to make pedestrians more visible with our treatment there would be a shorter crossing and obviously there'd be pedestrian islands or refuge islands installed to allow pedestrians to get out of the way of traffic if anything were to occur um, the hawk enters or the hawk installation controls vehicular traffic instead of just warning people of uh, pedestrians there it fully stops traffic and then at the same time we're also providing that shorter distance again um, on the tra vehicular impact tra traffic impacts um, the no build we're not going to have any impacts the road's going to stay the same um, and the rfb we are looking at traffic is needing to yield to on to crossing pedestrians um, the offset left turn lane would create a uh, harder to navigate left. Um, it's not anything crazy, but it is something that you have to get in between two islands to drive. And then this will also have minimal impacts on travel. You're just going to have to yield if there's someone there, if there's no one there, we're just going to go right through it. Um, with the Hawk, we're our, our vehicular traffic is going to need to come to a full stop for pedestrians. As you saw in the video, you're going to have the yield and then you're going to have the full stop. And obviously this, this is going to create some travel time delays if someone is using the crosswalk. Um, concerning all this uh, in the traffic analysis, the benefits and challenges Benish is recommending to the county that we they go forward with the rapid rectangular rapid flashing beacon but there is nothing set in stone at this point and that is one of the reasons we're having this conversation to get feedback from everybody um one last comparison between the two built alternatives um the rfb on the left and the hawk on the right these for the rfb you have a traffic warning device that is basically flashing lights that calls out vehicles to yield and makes those pedestrians in that crossing more visible. On the Hawk on the right, you're getting that full traffic signal, basically that gives you a full red light and stops, stops vehicles and gives pedestrians the time to cross. Uh, again, going back to the left on the RFB, pedestrians would only cross two lanes of traffic at, this, at a time, utilizing those two different pedestrian islands that would be installed or expanded. On the right hand side with the Hawk, we're going to be crossing more lanes, those three lanes at the same time. And it, with traffic completely stopped, people will continue on to the other lanes as well at the same time. Um, traffic wise, in both of these situations, we're still going to have two through lanes in each direction with left turn lanes. So that's not going to be a change. There, again, from the traffic analysis, we did not see any large changes with any traffic throughput or anything like that. It's the same as the existing really is right now. So at this time, we're going to open for questions. 
um, if anybody doesn't want to answer or ask a question now, um, all of this will be this entire presentation and a form will be available online on the Jefferson County website. If you're not able to get to it now, it's just a small form where we'd like to know your input from uh, how you use this intersection. Are you a big pedestrian user or do you just drive through this? And uh, um, what you would prefer of those three alternatives we gave you that no build that uh, RFB or the Hawk, and then also any other comments you would have about this intersection. So at this time, if you, if anybody wants to raise their hand using the gestures, um, Faith can unmute you, or we can just start going through the chat and answering questions. So while right. we're waiting for anybody to raise their hand, um, John, I do see um, a question asking if there were any other alternative lane configurations with the RRFB option. Yeah, so we looked into um, removing the left turn lane. Um, that was really the only realistic option. Um, and that removing that left turn lane gave us a uh, possibility of backing up some traffic on the inside through lane just because we did see occasionally one or two vehicles um, queuing there to take the left as um, westbound traffic came through so it really didn't become an option because we just don't want to have cars queuing in through lanes so we did not uh, we did look at it but it wasn't a realistic option to without impacting traffic in the area. Great, thank you. Um, um, I can start going through some of these. Awesome, please do. People asked. So uh, first one I'm seeing here is, uh, have we had any pedestrian accidents here in the last 10 years? Um, there were two accidents, I believe, in the last 10 years. Um, one involved a vehicle sideswiping a pedestrian on the corner. Um, and the other one was uh, similar, but it was with a bicyclist, and I believe they got a cracked helmet from it. And that was um, the extent there's, so there's those two in the last year or last, I believe about, one was 2016, one was 2014, if I believe correct, if I remember correctly. Yep, that's correct. We, uh, I just confirmed the crash data. So yes, we did have two pedestrians, we had one pedestrian, as John mentioned, and one bicycle crash, um, and that's over the last 10 years. Um, there was a question that came to me directly um, regarding the potential of a roundabout here instead. Um, I'll go ahead and answer that one, John. Uh, so the reason why we didn't identify a potential roundabout at this location was um, because we don't have any operational challenges here and the, the main concern is pedestrian crossings. Um, we just didn't, it wasn't really a, a even a consideration at the time because there were generally uh, roundabouts still need to meet our signal warrants. Um, so the, the approach traffic from Van Gordon would have to meet a certain threshold for a signal to be warranted. And then um, we kind of look at the alternative to a signal as being a roundabout option. So um, with that being kind of the approach for this, again, just kind of addressing pedestrian safety as the main the main component of this is why we did not look at uh, studying a roundabout at this location. Great. Um, it looks like Nicole has her hand up. Um, are you able to unmute her? Yeah, I'm here. To meet her. Awesome. <laughs> Great. Go ahead, Nicole. <laughs> Hi. So I live in the neighborhood right across from the park in Water's Edge. And um, I do like the option with the flashing beacon because there's one right down coal mine in front of Dakota Ridge High School. So I think people are kind of already used to that method or, you know, that th that would be something we're already used to seeing in this community. Um, one question I do have, uh, I walked my kids to Powderhorn Elementary, and so I'm, I'm very uh, familiar with the U-turns that are happening and the amount of people crossing. 
I have noticed that the school zone ends like right after Powderhorn, uh, west of Powderhorn on coal mine. So the school zone ends between Powderhorn and Van Gordon. Was there any discussion about moving the school zone a little bit past Van Gordon? So at least during those really busy times, people would be driving that 20 miles per hour. Kelly, this might be a good one for you actually. <clears throat> we didn't look at it, but we certainly could. Um, the further that we would put the limits of the school zone away from where the school activity is happening, that kind of does breed some disrespect for drivers. If they're too far out, they see the flashers, but they don't see students and pedestrians, then they tend to speed and disregard that. Um, but that said, we could look at what that distance is and where we're seeing some of the activity from the school and see if um, the limits of that school zone could be adjusted. So that's a great idea. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Cause I noticed when I'm walking, it's like, as soon as that school zone sign is done, which is before Van Gordon, um, people fly. So that could be helpful to the intersection as well. Great. Thank you for that feedback. Yeah. Thanks. There you go. Joseph, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, you mentioned only two cyclists cross that every weekend. Is that um, crossing or is that going through that intersection? So that would be crossing north-south um, across the same direction Van Gordon runs. And this was okay. just taken from a single day back in April, just so you know. Okay. The, yeah, I'm assuming at the height of summer, there's probably more cyclists. And, and I do a lot of bike riding and I come out through that intersection, turn left off of eastbound coal mine coming back home all the time. Um, did you look at what the loss of those acceleration and deceleration lanes might mean for the cyclists? Because I use that acceleration lane all the time. It, it makes that corner for me a little safer. So I can go ahead and answer that one, John. Um, yeah. We did not look at um, how it impacted cyclists. Um, ultimately, in on coal mine itself, there's no proposed facilities for on-street infrastructure um, for bicycle facilities, so no on-street bicycle lanes or um, buffer bicycle lanes, anything of that nature. Um, in our bicycle plan, we were really trying to encourage people on our major arterials to use the shared use paths just because that's um, ultimately, aside from intersections, the greatest safety is being completely separated from uh, vehicular traffic. Um, so no, we did not look at how it potentially impacted bicyclists um, and are really looking at the, the safety of the crossing in this instance. Okay, just to let you know, there's a shared use path from Ward up all the way around to uh, coal mine and Bowles. But that ends at Ward, and so I have been on the street from Van Gordon up to Ward. If you extend that down to Van Gordon, because I think actually it also is a shared use path, uh, though I'm not sure of that because I don't ride east that often. Um, but if you extend that shared use past that path down to Van Gordon, then there's no worry about losing that acceleration lane there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great feedback. We will, um, we'll take a closer look at that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Beverly, you can go ahead. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm a resident of Shadow Ridge for 26 plus years and been in the area for 31 years. I uh, walk across this intersection almost daily. My kids have grown up here, went to all three schools. <laughs> um, I've also, I'm also on the board of the West Meadows Metropolitan District and we are responsible for taking care of the property right there along coal mine. And um, we tried a couple times to get some type of crosswalk or um, safety thing here for pedestrians over the last 
probably 10, 12 years. Um, and, and nothing was ever approved. Uh, there, there were a couple studies, I think by Jeffco, um, and there was never enough traffic to warrant putting anything in. So I'm really happy to see that this is being uh, looked at again and something is being um, presented to, to help pedestrians with this crossing. It, in my observation, I, I feel like really the most dangerous times are when school is starting and when school is getting out. The rest of the day, the weekends are really not that bad in my opinion, based on my experience. Um, the, the one feedback thing I did want to put out is they did put up, a, I think it's the R, RRFB up at Dakota Ridge between Dakota Ridge crossing over to Walmart. And there was a high school girl that got hit at crossing that area. And that's what um, encountered or um, ended up happening. They put in an RRFB up there. What I've noticed with that is, yes, it helps. Um, but just like a week and a half ago, I was driving westbound up to Bowles and I was in the left lane. And as I approached that RRFB at Dakota Ridge, it was flashing. So I stopped, I slowed down, I stopped. There was a car, I look, happened to glance in my rear view mirror, there was a car coming up behind me. He or she went into the right lane and blew right through it. And this student was in front of my car when this car did this. I mean, five more feet, this kid would have been hit. So, I mean, that's the closest I've come to people blowing through this. And it's not the first time. Now, that doesn't mean that I think the hawk should be put in up here. It's probably not that extreme. But um, I just wanted to bring that up just from my own personal observation and something to think about. Um, it, it concerned me, <laughs> it really did. <laughs> yeah, that's that's totally fair, Beverly. Thanks so much for sharing that experience. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge at any crossing that requires you to cross more than one lane of traffic, right? Um, right. Especially in those instances where you're stopped and the pedestrian is in front of you. So the motorist behind you might not even see that pedestrian. There are those blind spots. And uh, it's an unfortunate natural hazard with having anybody cross more than one lane of traffic. Um, and, you know, I think that that's one thing that is a little bit of a difference um, on our perspective as well for the RFB is that you do have those pedestrian refuge islands. So you're only crossing two lanes and then one lane and then another two. So if there's ever a concern as a pedestrian where you feel, oh man, maybe nobody, maybe that second lane of traffic isn't able to see me, then you have this pedestrian refuge that allows you to, um, to remove yourself from those three lanes. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's an extreme challenge and, and, you know, it's one thing that hopefully, um, you know, the, the data behind the RFBs showing that they have pretty high compliance. Um, hopefully the experiences that you're seeing are few and far between. Um, but we really appreciate you, you shedding some light on that. Yeah. And I, I, I think, I think part of the challenge too is, is it is a high school and, they're young drivers and they like to drive fast. <laughs> so, that's, yeah. and, that, and that's what I see down here at Van Gordon Way and coal mine as well. You know, it's, it tends to be the, the morning school traffic and it's not always the students. I don't want to put it all on them, but they love to fly down that hill. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's why in these efforts, we really try to make really strong designs because it's the best we can do to try to curb some of those bad behaviors from motorists. Um, but right. yeah. yeah, well, I, I definitely, I guess, um, you know, my, I would favor the RFB ba based on, or uh, uh, rather than having nothing. So I, I think absolutely. it looks like a good option to me. Great, thank you so much for the feedback, thank Beverly. You. you bet. Allison, you can go ahead. Yes, thank you for holding this town hall. This is really great at Jefferson County. 
I walk across that intersection twice a day. I take my dogs across every morning and every evening. Um, I don't try to cross it during school crossings. I walk up the hill and I use the stoplight and cross up there. But the rest of the time, I do try, I, I prefer crossing at there at Van Gordon just because it, it's just more convenient and I don't like having to walk up that hill through the sprinkler systems. I've seen several small children crossing that on their bicycles and the cars coming from both directions can't see because of the curve of the road and because of the, of the trees down the middle of the road, they really can't see us until the last minute. So um, I've seen several near misses of small children. Most adults who cross there, we wait until we don't see cars coming from either direction before we cross. But I've made it to the middle and suddenly there's been cars coming in both directions. And all I can do is just stand there and watch them blow by me at 40 miles an hour in both directions. It's not their fault. It's posted 40 and they couldn't see me. I'm The way that the road is, is developed, they could not see me. And it wasn't my fault. I went at a time when there was no cars visible. So I'm really happy that you're, that you're studying this. And, and I'm glad you're doing it before there is any major accident because it, it, the way it's set up, it's just a matter of time. And so I really appreciate it. I, I think the RFB is absolutely appropriate for this particular intersection. I don't think um, that we need the, the more intense one at this time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Allison. Thanks for your hey, John, would you mind going um, back to the slide with the um, two different alternatives side by side? So there's something yeah. that was just mentioned um, by Allison that I wanted to just kind of highlight, especially with that uh, visibility component. So when John was highlighting the, um, the fact that we're gonna be reducing those uh, we're going to be creating those bulb outs so you can kind of see and john are you will you move your mouse around are we able to see your mouse oh we can fantastic so see where john is highlighting in the rfb where that bulb out comes out um and then there's a bulb out on the south side of the intersection as well and what that does um is especially with any landscaping or anything it brings pedestrians further into the roadway um well the existing roadway the future not roadway um, where, you know, some of that vegetation and some of that landscaping, um, again, kind of highlight pedestrians being more visible as they approach the intersection. So, uh, you know, hopefully one of these designs will also kind of resolve some of those visibility issues that you've mentioned. Yep, and I just want to piggyback on it, since you mentioned having to stop in the middle. Um, with those islands, uh, we would be expanding that median as well. Um, it currently wouldn't if we try to put something through there, wouldn't it meet ADA standards? So we want to make sure we it would be expanded. I believe it's two feet, but that would be large enough for like a wheelchair to stop or like a bicycle to stop in the middle without having tires like out in the travel lanes. So we received a question about potentially lowering the speed limits on uh, coal mine and I'll go ahead and answer this one. Um, so how roadway speed limits are generally set is through a roadway design. Um, and so roadway design takes into consideration, you know, curb radii, um, lane widths, those types of elements. Um, with the general roadway design is what we kind of set our standard for um, the speed limit. So when we look at potentially reducing the speed limit itself, um, studies continue to show that without some sort of design treatment that the average speed does not simply drop with your or the 85th percentile. So I'll expand on that a little bit more. So the 84th percentile of a uh, of when we collect traffic data and we're collecting speed data, we often look at the 85th percentile. Um, there's the basically how the study shows, if any of you are curious why um, when you get your license, you have to have your license for about 10 years before you can rent a car. Uh, a lot of the studies behind that show that motorists become accustomed to seeing standard roadway design and therefore know this roadway looks really wide and so it has a faster speed limit likely. Um, so, with that 85th percentile, if we were to collect speed data here, and we might have already, I'm not sure, 
um, we'll look at that 84th percentile and 85% of people showing that the speed limit here, if it's 40, um, if people are going within that five miles per hour, it shows that the design of the road is highlighting that this is the appropriate speed limit set. So when we're looking at these, um, it's you're, we will not automatically reduce speed limits simply because it does not show to be effective in reducing speed. You have to have some sort of design elements to reduce that speed limit, if that makes sense. Um, Hopefully that was as clear as mud, but uh, I'm happy to expand if there's anything that you that wasn't exactly clear on that. Awesome, thank you, Amy. Um, there's a question about a pedestrian bridge or tunnel. Um, ultimately, with there's so this type of project um, we fund through our safety budget, which is relatively limited, um, and that type of infrastructure is far too costly for what the county can afford. Um, it's just kind of the reality of what our uh, constrained budgets provide us with. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Oh, there is something regarding um, connecting to the trail system. Um, we haven't looked directly at how this would impact the surrounding trail network. Um, we just, again, just have highlighted this as um, a known location that lots of folks are crossing um, and it just needs those enhancements. So Ultimately, yes, it will improve the trail experience for folks getting to the park set to the park network. Um, but uh, parks and rec would the Foothills Park and Rec District would have more knowledge of how this might benefit uh, their trail network. Um, great question, Amy, about the realistic option and what will be the best option can be put in place. Um, we are presenting both of these as realistic options. Um, the, yeah, so I mean, I guess that's the best way to put it. Literally, either one of these are a feasible option for the county to install at this time. That is to say that we will have to, um, once we get past this phase, we'll go into um a greater design process and determine if say the uh the hawk is far too costly compared to the rfb that would naturally make a um would kind of put one over the other if one is simply not affordable for the county's budget uh so can i ask if did we consider installing the RFB further east or west away from the complexity of the intersection? Um, further east, um, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, there's the large U-turn movement on the other side of the intersection, which makes it unrealistic to put some, a crosswalk there. And then if you keep going further east, um, you have obviously the big curve in the road and you get back up to the schools where there's already crossings. So it's not really warranted to really put anything in that area. Um, we did look at possibly doing something further to the west, uh, but the biggest issue with that is just uh, compliance with drivers and what drivers are used to. Again, um, drivers are used to people crossing at intersections. Uh, mid, -cro mid block crossings do end up being a little more dangerous, so we do prefer putting it here at the intersection. I can answer the question about time frame. So um, we are, uh, after we complete this process with the community um, and other stakeholders that we've invited, um, we'll begin the design process of both these alternatives and determine which one is most feasible. And then uh, we will have a decision made by, oh, Kelly, help me out, maybe in about six months, but this will go under construction next summer um, and be completed in summer of 2023. So um, within a year, this will be will be installed. Uh, 
Beverly, yes, um, thank you. Uh, uh, as Kelly mentioned, we will definitely explore the options for expanding that school zone. Um, Kelly kind of mentioned that as you progress further away from where there's a lot of students present, compliance with those school zones can decrease. So we'll have to do a little bit more study in the area to determine um, kind of where children are most present and, and would result in still high compliance at that school zone. Yeah, Kenny, thanks for that. The uh, with the intersection um, comment. So the RFBs that are not there. So um, that's absolutely accurate. There are locations, several locations throughout the county where we install them at mid blocks. Um, but the data just supports that mid block crossings are still uh, less safe than crossing at intersections. So we try to discourage those where we can. In regards to the question on timeline, um, John or Christina, did we have a date when we're hoping people can submit those survey responses in the link that we dropped? Um, and then we can get feedback within that timeline. What would that date be? Yeah, so um, if everybody could, if they want to submit comments, submit those within the next two weeks, we'll be able to in, um, incorporate those into our final report for these alternatives. That'll be presented to the county staff. And we, we appreciate everyone saying this in the chat, but if you wouldn't mind also to take the survey as well, that'll be the more formal way that we're able to track that. So we, we want your input heard, so please go through the full motion of submitting um, the survey response. Uh, Dave, you, you have a good point there about moving the intersection further west. Where, we're trying to meet the location where we see people crossing. Um, you know, you might even look at the map and think, oh, the signal at the park there at Ward. And I think one of our residents here said that she walks over there some days. Um, that is an option, but it's it's not the desire path where we're seeing people. So that's another reason that we look to keep it directly at this intersection. Yeah, and we see if you move it further to the west, there will be people just because they're coming from the neighborhood and there's not really any homes on um, that southwest quadrant, people are going to want to go as close to their home as possible. Great. Does anybody else have any other questions? I don't know if we've missed any in the chat. If we did, please speak up, raise your hand, or um, re enter it into the chat. So you can address it if you have it. All right, I think that's going to be a wrap. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we look forward to increasing the safety for pedestrians at this intersection. And uh, again, if you could do that um, survey, that, that comment form for us, that would be greatly appreciated. And again, this presentation and that form link will be posted um, on the Jefferson County website for anybody that is looking for it. Yeah, and I'll just uh, tag onto that real quick. Um, I, if anybody's having any issues using the QR code to access this, um, our webpage, my email was on the notice that you all received. So please feel free to reach out to me directly. I'm happy to provide you with a direct link to our webpage. Um, and then also share the word with your neighbors if they weren't able to attend tonight, but they have interest in this, um, please encourage them to watch the recording, especially the presentation component, um, so that they're a little bit more informed when making their, their decision. Um, but yeah, as, as John said, we're excited to continue working on this intersection and make some great improvements here. Awesome. Have a great night, everyone. Have a good night.